Hi, I'm Robert Pierce, and I'm responsible for vacuum at ETA. In this talk, I hope to introduce you to the universe of vacuum and how important vacuum is to ETA. Now, vacuum um, can be considered um, absolutely nothing, and uh, hence this talk is a talk about nothing. But hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll see there's more to nothing than you first imagined. So we start with the early days of, of vacuum, and probably the earliest reference to vacuum is in the Bible in Genesis, where it talks about um, the earth being um, devoid of anything um, and without form. And Aristotle um, was interested in the concept of, of vacuum um, and decided that it was a logical contradiction. I, you couldn't have uh, nothing uh, on earth. The phrase nature adores, uh, adores a vacuum is attributed to Aristotle. And um, so this philosophical concept was that it's just really not possible to have nothing. There are things everywhere and you can't really have nothing. Um, and vacuum was only first really understood um, in 1644 by Torricelli, who was a student of Galileo and first produced and understood uh, vacuum at the same time. And what he did was to take tubes um, um, filled with mercury and turn them upside down into a basin of mercury. And what he found was that uh, the area at the top of the tube, um, the, the mercury flowed out, but it didn't continue to flow out. And he concluded that the reason that the mercury didn't continue to flow out of the, uh, the tube was that there was a force from the atmosphere um, pressing down uh, upon the mercury within the basin underneath. And Torricelli was the first person to really comprehend that. Galileo hadn't com comprehended it uh, before. Um, vacuum then um, did not have much application, um, but in um, it's recorded in 1768 by uh, Joseph Wright, and the, the picture is in the National Gallery in London. Um, uh, people took pumps um, and experimented. And here in this picture, you see a bird in the vacuum um, chamber, and they pumped the air out of the chamber, and the bird uh, slowly started to die um, through um, a lack of, lack of air. And you see, um, the young lady there in, in, in great uh, distress because of the vacuum and the, the, dying, um, the dying bird. Now on ETA, um, we need vacuum everywhere. Um, we need it for our cryostat, we need it for our heating systems, we need it for our auxiliary systems, and, and primarily we need it for um, our plasma chamber. Um, and so on ETA, we really love vacuum. Uh, so let's have a few basics, what, what uh, vacuum really is. So a perfect vacuum, um, a bit like Aristotle said, um, doesn't even really exist, not even in outer space. It's extremely um, rare to have um, an area with absolutely nothing in it. Um, there are particles um, everywhere in the universe as we know it. Um, but vacuum um, primarily can just be thought of as a reduction in, in the pressure or a reduction in the pressure in the environment. Um, any pressure less than atmosphere um, can be considered a, as a vacuum. And quite simply put, um, if we have a, like a container, um, you see on, on the left there, um, the, uh, the atmosphere with many, um, many particles within the container. And if we reduce the number of particles in that sealed container or the number of molecules in that sealed container, then uh, we're starting to produce a vacuum. Now, vacuum um, is, uh, has many units of measure, um, uh, and uh, the original original unit was from um, Tor Torcelli's um, uh, experiment, and um, was effectively in millimeters of mercury, or in um, in the USA uh, in in inches um, inches of mercury. Um, and in different nations, people use different um, different units. So the USA uses uh, the Tor, uh, obviously comes from the name of um, Torricelli. Uh, in Europe, uh, the millibar is, is used um, extensively, but it could also be measured in terms of the number of particles in a, in a uh, meter cubed, or um, as the French um, uh, 
uh, scientist philosopher um, named it the uh, the Pascal um, is uh, the SI unit, um, and that can also be translated into newtons newtons per meter squared, i.e., having an interaction with the the force which is uh, produced when you when you have a vacuum. So atmospheric um, pressure comes from the gravitational force of the molecules in the air um, above the atmosphere. And at sea level, this corresponds to point one, roughly to 0 0.1 of a megapascal, um, or the equivalent of 10 tons uh, per meter squared. So quite a considerable um, force. Uh, if you go to the top of Mount Everest, there is less uh, air above you, and you come to a pressure of something like uh, 33 um, uh, kilopascals. The force um, uh, due to vacuum is often uh, not fully appreciated. Um, in Europe, we have uh, a premier scientific laboratory um, called uh, Karlsruhe Institute of, of Technology. And um, on the left, on the right there, you see um, one of their setups for testing the conductances in, in vacuum. And they produce those two chambers you see um, to be uh, sitting on, on wheels, and they had a bellows in between them, and they have channels in between, between the two. When they first evacuated, um, their, um, their two systems decided to uh, join each other, causing some, uh, some damage, i.e. due to the, uh, the, the force of vacuum. And on the left there, you see um, a bellows. It's actually a double bellows, and uh, that was at a manufacturer, and they just thought they would um, uh, evacuate um, the, the chamber in between the, the two walls of the bellows and had not realized that uh, the force would be quite considerable and there you see the, the support which, um, which bent due to the vacuum force. Um, the vacuum force was first um, started to be understood a bit better um, uh, in Europe, in Germany, in uh, Magdeburg and um, there is um, uh, a um, a historical example where a number of horses were used to pull, try and pull apart uh, some spheres, um, half spheres, which had uh, been uh, partly evacuated with a, uh, a vacuum pump. And that, that force uh, yeah, was quite considerable, uh, a lot of horses. And uh, we're going to just show that in um, a recreation of that experiment with, with, with people now in a video. We get on to the first demonstration. And for the first demonstration, I need two volunteers. Um, and it would be great if there's any department leaders here um, who would like to come down. Um, now I'm trying to think. Yeah, we've got one. We need two volunteers. Someone, someone stronger than... We um... <laughs> need one, one more person, so one more volunteer. Um... Come on, come on, this is... Yeah, okay, so we've got two volunteers, okay. <laughs> Um. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not the men in white coats coming to take them away. It's just just to, just just to uh, just to help them. Okay, so um, so I just get Liam and Silvio just to lift up the apparatus. You can see them there. Um, we have what we call two vacuum um, flanges. So so these are, these are rather small, and um, we're going to uh, put these two together. Um, and maybe we need somebody else to hit the pump. Um. Ah, yeah, here we go. Okay, so this is a vacuum pump, and if you can see it, we have a pressure um, being read there, so we're down to, um, I think this is in, oh, it's in Pascal, so we're gradually going down to, um, oh, this is in Pascal's. So having some problem, they've got a leak there. <laughs> You know, this worked um, perfectly when we tried it earlier. Maybe we'll do this one in a bit, Robert.
going then? Anyone? Is he going? No. You know, vacuum is uh, extremely easy to produce. Um, you just need a pump. And um, I think we tried this five times earlier. Worked first time. Um, we will um, we have one more quick attempt. Um, and um, here we go. So there's a, some important lessons here. Um, you for vacuum, you need cleanliness. Um, and it appears we've got a little bit dirty. So uh, we're cleaning up here. OK. <laughs> yeah, typical commissioning problems, yeah. Okay, pressure's coming down again. Let's keep it coming. Looks good. Okay. Um, so, um, our two volunteers are now going to um, try and pull the uh, two halves apart um, and demonstrate um, that they're stronger than vacuum. So, <laughs> okay, <laughs> a bit of encouragement. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> I would like to say that they were passed by DDB horses. Yeah, that's right. Um, so, and now if we um, if we cause a little leak on this. There we go. Cool. <laughs> so this was first actually um, shown in 1656 um, in, um, in uh, Germany. Um, and uh, the guy who did this first demonstration was the mayor of um, Magdeburg. And uh, he put two spheres together and he tried to pull them apart um, with, with horses. Um, in fact, the, the force for those two, um, the air pressure, effectively the air pressure holding those two vacuum spheres together for our demonstration, um, if you, it's worked out on the area, so it's around 200 kilos um, they needed to pull to pull it apart, and we reckon there was nobody here who could do that. So, <laughs> so now I'm going to just tell you a little bit more about um, the types of vacuum. So, if, um, if we look on the uh, the, the top there, you, you see um, you see a chamber with with molecules within within that chamber, um, and when you have a what I would call a slight vacuum, um, you have a regime which we call viscous flow, and in viscous flow, um, the molecules interact with with each other, i.e., they hit each other regularly, and they they have collisions, and the collisions um, are, are dominant. And, and in this situation, um, you can uh, reduce the pressure effectively by sucking because the molecules interact um, with each other. Um, and your classic vacuum cleaner does that. It's uh, in the viscous flow regime. It's not a very good vacuum. Um, and uh, you have this interaction. You can, um, you can blow, you can suck. Um, however, when you get to a better vacuum, um, what we call molecular flow, uh, shown on, on the bottom chamber there, then you have a long mean free path between the molecules. So you don't have many more, so many molecules within your chamber. And rather than the molecules um, hitting each other as a dominant phenomenon, they hit the walls as a dominant phenomenon. And so there is no real interaction between the molecules. Um, and because there's no real interaction between the molecules, if you want to uh, remove molecules, you can't suck on them. Um, you can't you can't extract them by sucking because they don't interact with each other, and hence they, they have their own path which goes uh, randomly against the, uh, the wall. So you have these two um, regimes at the extreme of vacuum, and in between you have a transition flow regime, which is somewhere in between the two, where you have some interactions but not many interactions. So where vacuum is used and found in different, in different levels, so we've already mentioned uh, atmosphere where we have... Um, something like 2.5 times 10 to the 25 particles per, per meter cubed. Um, 
uh, in our sea level atmosphere. And we reduce that, we can reduce that a bit with um, a good vacuum cleaner where we go down about 20%. So um, we, we drop the, uh, uh, we can drop with a, with a vacuum cleaner, we can uh, maybe even a bit more, we can drop, drop the, the pressure so we get something like two, two um, particles per, per meter cubed. Um, and then um, in the industry, we have um, the freeze drying um, situation where we drop down to maybe 40, uh, 40 pascals. So quite significantly down. And your, your old light bulbs of the old, old um, type, which we get less and less of, uh, we drop down that again by about a, a factor, uh, 100 to 0.4 of a pascal. Um, for your thermos flask, um, uh, which is an insulating vacuum, we come down to uh, something around 4, 10 to the minus 2 pascals, so drop down again. Or the old television tubes, um, uh, we have a vacuum within those, maybe down to 10 to the minus 7 pascals. Um, on ITER, we have a number of vacuums, um, and the lowest ones are down to about 10 to the minus 8 uh, pascals. Um, our sister project, uh, the LHC at CERN, uh, drops down lower um, uh, and down to 10 to the minus 9 pascals. And if we get really extreme, so the surface of the moon, uh, we go down to 10 to the minus 10 um, pascals. Or interstellar space, um, the lowest vacuum we know about, really, but 10 to the minus 16 pascals. But even at that interstellar space, there's still um, 100,000 particles. Uh, per meter cubed. So let's talk now a bit more about tokamaks. And tokamaks um, are the machine uh, are the machines which uh, have uh, a strong, um, you know, strongly being developed for uh, fusion power purposes. And ITER is the largest one. Um, there are tokamaks around the world um, at different uh, states of um, age and different states of development. Um, and if we, if we look at um, East, which is in China, then uh, they have a main vacuum volume of uh, 40 meter cubed and a cryostat volume of 180. K-Star, which is in Korea, goes up in size. It has a vacuum volume of 100 meter cubed and a cryostat volume of, of 400 meter cubed. Um, JET, which is uh, was the European Union's flagship Tokamak, has a vacuum volume of some uh, 189 meters cubed. And ITER is going bigger. It has a vacuum volume of nearly 1,400 meter cube. Um, and its cryostat, um, the actual size of the cryostat is some 14,000 meter cube with a cryostat uh, vacuum volume, because we put a lot in there, of around 8,400 meter cube. So why do we need such um, big vacuums for fusion? And uh, uh, this, this can be, um, understood with an equation, but could also be understood with a little love story. So um, the equation um, is called the Goldston formula, and it gives the approximate um, the vessel size and shape. Um, and it talks about the confinement time. Now, the confinement time is all about how long um, particles stay together um, within the vacuum chamber um, to increase their likelihood of fusing. So the confinement time needs to be large in order to get fusion. Um, and the confinement time um, is proportional to the current you put through the plasma. Um, on ITER, we put up to 17 million amps. Um, and, but it's, divi it does, it's divided by the density of the plasma and the temperature. So as we increase the temperature of the plasma, um, there's a tendency for the particles to uh, move apart and not be confined anymore. But it's also a function um, of the elongation of the chamber and the aspect ratio. So the larger the volume, this increases uh, the particle diffusion time across the, uh, the field line. So we have more success to get fusion with a, um, with a, larger, a larger vessel. Perhaps it can be explained a little bit like um, a love story. So maybe even my love story. Um, so when I first met my partner, um, we... Um, uh, spent some time together, but we were not immediately attracted to one another. Um, however, as we spent more time together, um, uh, eventually we fell in fell in love, and as it were, we um, we fused. 
and, um, and we produce four, four lovely children. Um, same with particles. If we keep the particles together uh, for long enough, um, we can have tonk, um, quantum tunneling effects um, and we can get uh, a higher probability of fusion of those particles. So a little bit more about the ETA vacuum system. Um, ETA's main vacuums, um, we start in the green in the center with the main, um, the main vacuum chamber, which is the key one um, where the fusion um, occurs. But uh, there are many more chambers. So um, the cryostat uh, has to keep our magnets cold. Um, they have to be well insulated. So we have a huge cryostat, um, and that cryostat is at pressures below about 10 to the minus 4 um, pascals, um, and is our, our biggest uh, vacuum on ETA. Um, we have many clients which need vacuum because they either connect to the main vacuums or they need vacuum for their own uh, running. So we have a service vacuum which has something like 5,000 different clients. And then we're going to talk about a bit later, we have uh, the neutral beam vacuum systems. This is one way we heat the plasma. Um, and vacuum is very important for neutral beam. And then all of the lines which are cryogenic coming in and all of the distribution for our cryogenic, both for our magnets and for our cryo pump, all need vacuum um, in order to function correctly to insulate. So this is just a picture of the ETA uh, vacuum system. It's an overview block diagram. And on the right-hand side, you see all of these big uh, volumes. And on the left-hand side, you, you see um, the exhaust, as it were. And in between, um, we have pumps of various different types to transfer gases out of, of the vessels um, and bring them through to our tritium plant where they're, they're processed and um, to give a, a clean exhaust on the left. And a bird's eye view of this, um, this system is this massive network of pipes with more than 10 kilometers of pipes. The pumps um, in red and orange in the middle, um, a vacuum pumping room in the square. And we, we have something like 18 large cryo pumps, 300 mechanical pumps, um, and over 10 different technologies um, uh, in the vacuum system uh, as a whole. Um, and we'll give you a little bit more detail on this, um, but it's a big first of a kind uh, in terms of size and complexity. We think the most complex vacuum system ever to be built on Earth. The purpose of ETA's vacuum systems then. So we have different purposes for different um, parts. Um, the cryostat, um, its main purpose is just an insulating vacuum, um, a bit like your thermos flask. It keeps the superconducting magnets um, um, cool. Um, the same is true of our guard vacuums for feeders and cryogenic uh, valve boxes. Um, then we have the vacuum vessel uh, plasma chamber. And the vacuum has a number of different functions. One is to minimize the number of gases in there which are not intended to be part of the plasma or um, part of the, um, the fueling of, of the plasma. Um, it's also to provide a, um, an environment where the fuel can be ionized to form a plasma. And we'll talk a bit about that later. Uh, it's also to provide um, a containment for, for gases and for dust. Um, which may be um, toxic or, 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 or active. So it provides the actual chamber um, and the outer boundary provides a confinement system. And it's also to provide a part of what we call the fuel cycle so that everything is contained and recycled um, for processing. Um, we have the neutral beam systems, which provide its main purpose there is to provide a gas-free path for the energetic, energetic neutrals, which really heat the plasma. And then we have various functions with our other heating systems for the plasma and diagnostics. So talking a little bit about um, insulating vacuums, um, heat transfer can be by a number of different mechanisms, by conduction, by convection, by radiation. And um, what the vacuum does, it firstly minimizes conduction and it pretty well eliminates um, convection. So, and it's also the case that good vacuum also helps reduce radiation effects by avoiding surfaces which are reflective um, and have low emissivity um, from becoming contaminated and changing their emissivity. And so you have, um, I think we have some 31 magnet feeders which feed the magnets, which all need to have this low heat transfer. And we have 100 plus uh, cryogenic lines which also need um, vacuum and valve boxes shown in the 16 cold valve boxes shown 
and then the picture on the right. So heat conduction um, um, is gas species dependent. Um, for example, hydrogen has seven times the conductivity of nitrogen. It's also temperature dependent. So it's three times lower at 80K than it is at um, room, room temperature. Um, and it's also um, geometrically um, dependent, um, but becomes linear when we get into this flow regime, which we call um, molecular flow, flow. So you can see in the graph there on the right, um, the thermal conductivity um, against the pressure, and you see the thermal conductivity is right down as we um, have low pressures below uh, 0.1 of a Pascal. Um, convection in vacuum can't occur when we get into this molecular flow regime, and you see there a graph of the convective heat transfer with respect to um, atmospheric pressure. And we can see as you go down to 100 Pascals and below, um, then convection uh, starts to uh, disappear. So ETA's cryostat um, is designed for a, a low base pressure to give us this good um, um, low heat transfer characteristics. It contains thermal shields with, um, with uh, more than 32 kilometers of helium um, piping within there. And these thermal shields are, are silver, silver coated for uh, low emissivity. Um, when the magnets actually cool down, um, you see the magnets there on the left, when they actually cool down to four and a half K, they also act as a, um, a cryopump, cryopumping um, of a, any um, condensable gases. Um, but they have no capacity to um, pump helium. Um, vacuum and the uh, system in the plas plasma chamber um, provides um, an environment where the fuel can be ionized um, which minimizes the gas which are not intended um, to be within the plasma. Um, and this initially helps us in, in the initiation of a plasma. Um, if we had, if we were at atmospheric pressure, we would just not be able to generate um, a, a useful plasma within the um, chamber. Um, and what happens when we have impurities in the, um, in the plasma is uh, as they heat up, they, um, they ionize and uh, they radiate the heat out of the plasma. We're trying to get as much heat into the plasma in order to eventually get to temperatures of the order of 100 plus million degrees. So we don't want impurities in there which will radiate the heat out as they go through their ionization states. Uh, and then finally, um, as the fusion occurs, our waste product is helium. Now, if we don't remove that helium by pumping, then the helium dilutes the plasma and we get to a point where the fusion starts to tail off. Um, so um, it's an important part of the vacuum system to remove um, the helium from, from the plasma. Um, and as I said, we provide radioactive gas and dust confinement and provide a part of the, uh, the fuel cycle. So let's talk a little bit about discharges within vacuum because this is Another important role of vacuum is to promote the ability to ionize our fuel so that we can produce a plasma. Um, and then we are able to um, heat that plasma and confine it because it's ionized. Um, you see a few graphs there. You, and the first one at the top um, you see um, along the bottom scale is the pressure um, times the, uh, the uh, dimension uh, in meters. And you can see there that you get a point where, um, uh, a low point there where um, the pressure is such that we need a small voltage in order to um, ionize the plasma of uh, what they're showing is about 300 volts for that particular arrangement. Um, the um, two graphs at the bottom are um, graphs from a, what we call a glow discharge. And again, you see um, the DC voltage on, on the left and um, the pressure on, on the bottom. And you see um, that you can get uh, the bright pressure regime, you get um, uh, a discharge within the vacuum, um, electrical breakdown um, at the relatively low DC voltage. And the, the graph on the left there, um, you just see the comparison between different gases. So the deuterium 
and helium, how they ionize uh, more or less eas easily. So the helium is, uh, in this case, easier to ionize than the, uh, the deuterium. So vacuum's um, role then in the formation of a tokamak plasma. Um, so when you start um, up uh, a machine like ETA, um, then you need to induce a, uh, a loop voltage in order to, um, and then introduce some, some gas, a small amount of gas into this very nice uh, vacuum. And then you get a breakdown um, and you form a Townsend uh, discharge. Um, but the problem with the Townsend discharge, as soon as you get a discharge, you get ionization. And as you know, um, like charged particles tend to uh, push, push themselves apart. Um, it's Coulomb forces push the particles apart. And you need to increase the plasma um, current in order to start to get stable, confined conditions um, for that plasma and to transform into a uh, tokamak plasma with, with high current. Um, the um, top uh, picture there shows the uh, magnetic hexipolynol produced on, on jet to start up. Um, and on ETA, we're a little bit low in the voltage which we can produce on the, um, uh, for, for, for the loop voltage to get ionization. So we also have the provision of a electron cyclotron resonance heating system to give us some ionization of the gas um, to aid in the starting of, um, of the plasma. Um, but the main thing is that the good vacuum conditions are, are essential to get to that point. Um, we're now just gonna have a little demonstration of producing a, um, a plasma within a vacuum chamber. And uh, for this demonstration, um, I would like you to imagine the date is 2025, 31st of, um, 31st of December, and um, we have, um, over the Christmas period, um, commissioned the magnets ready. We have, um, uh, we have got ready to, we have a, a reasonable vacuum in the, in the, uh, in the chamber, and um, we have the magnets running. Uh, We've injected some gas into the plasma chamber, and then um, all we need to do is turn the electron cyclotron heating on. So if you can think, think of the, the scene, 2025, um, and we will get, have a countdown um, if Liam's ready. Just getting a little more gas in, <laughs> okay. So, So here we have a, um, a camera on the, um, on the vacuum chamber. Uh, behind, um, for the purposes of the demonstration, rather than a poloidal fill coil, we've got a static um, uh, permanent magnet. And rather than the ECH system, we have a 1.5 uh, kV um, uh, voltage power supply. Um, are we ready? <laughs> Okay. Nearly there. Ready? Okay. So let's see if the first plasma, if you could join with me in doing the countdown, we start at five um, to first plasma. Okay, so five, four, three, two, one, plasma, yay! <laughs> So, um, so this plasma at the moment is confined by a toroidal permanent magnet, um, and Liam's going to increase the pressure slightly. Um, so when the pressure increases, the Coulomb forces between the ions uh, will, should start to push it out um, into the main chamber. So we'll see how far we go. We might just extinguish it, but we'll see how we do. Now you can see it moving. Yeah, it's starting to come out now. Uh, no, it's gone back in. <laughs> oh, there we go. Uh, no. Can we go anymore?
Okay. Yep, that's great. Okay, we kill the pump. Okay, thank you. So good vacuum is also needed throughout the um, operational period. Again, because of this reason that if we have particles which are not refueling particles and not, um, um, and particularly particles which are of, of higher mass, then they cause um, uh, radiation of the heat out of the plasma. And the graph there uh, just shows the different atomic numbers and the, um, the, the, the fraction um, of the, um, the radiation power which you produce for the, for the different masses. So um, effectively, as you see there, you see helium at the top, so it's not, um, it's not radiating um, out a lot of the heat, but if you get down to the bottom where you've got um, molybdenum and uh, silver down there, the zinc along the way, you see that uh, the higher mass numbers um, are radiating out a lot of, a lot of heat if they get uh, within, within the plasma. Um, and this is also one of the reasons why on the, um, the, the wall on the inside of the, um, the vacuum chamber, we're also using uh, beryllium. Um, which has uh, a very low mass and hence a low radiative uh, power loss. So on ITER, um, to sustain the fusion, the plasma must be continuously pumped. And uh, the way it works is essentially we have a, what we call a diverter in the bottom of the plasma chamber. And the particle flux lines are organized such that particles, uh, ions come down to the um, diverter where they're neutralized and then can flow along the diverter ducts to the cryo pumps, which are positioned around the machine. Um, and this is in the uh, transition flow regime. Um, and the pumps pump the helium, the deuterium, the tritium fuel. Um, and later, that all of the fuels which are pumped are separated off and recycled, and, and the helium is removed. Um, we also use um, cryo pumps on the neutral beam system. And uh, we have a video which shows this. Uh, on the neutral beam system, we inject gas into the, new, into the ionizer, which produces ions. These are accelerated out with high voltage. It goes through a cloud of gas and into the plasma where the plasma is heated. Now the cryo pumps play in a very important role in this. And maybe we just show the video one more time. Yeah, so as the um, ions are produced um, and accelerated, then gas particles, mainly neutralized, come to the cryo pumps, and the gas injected to neutralize them go to the cryo pumps. And then we have residual ion dumps where any ions which have come off uh, are neutralized. And again, that gas has to go to the cryo pumps. So now for the technologies to produce vacuum. On ITER. Um, the technologies for vacuum pumping are, are quite diverse um, and the technology to pump depends quite a lot on the gas regime. So we have displacement pumps, we have capture pumps um, and where we have viscous flow um, we use scroll pumps and we use screw pumps. When we're in the transition we use roots pumps um, which are these lobes which um, rotate and we use drag pumps. And when we're in the molecular flow uh, regime, we have turbo molecular pumps, iron pumps, getter pumps, um, and also, uh, as we've already mentioned, a number of different cryogenic condensation and sorption pumps. So cryogenic condensation pumps work a little bit like um, your, your freezer um, at, at home. And if you leave the door of your freezer open, you'll find that uh, water molecules um, within the air will stick to your, your freezer panels and, and frost up. And this is exactly how uh, a cryo pump works when it's a condensation pump. So when we get down to 80K, we can pump water, we can pump some CO2, 
and we can pump some oils and hydrocarbons. If we reduce the temperature lower, we can, so 20K, we can pump argon, nitrogen, oxygen, um, most of the gases which are in air. But if we want to pump um, uh, hydrogen and deuterium and tritium, then we, we run at um, 4.2K, um, and then we, we manage to freeze the hydrogen, the deuterium, the tritium, and neon onto the pumps. Um, but we have a problem if we want to um, we want to pump um, helium because um, helium is still uh, gaseous um, at, uh, at uh, vacuum pressures um, uh, at 4.2 K. So condensation doesn't work for us um, for, for helium. Uh, you see a couple of graphs there. On, on the left, you see the um, um, uh, what we call the critical uh, point diagram. And in order to get our pumps to work at 4.2K, we, we use this regime called supercritical, which you see on the graph there. Um, you also see on the graph um, more to the right that uh, you know, the different gases and what vapor pressure you get from those um, gases um, at the different temperatures. And you see how helium is, is off that, that chart. So for helium, we need to use cryosorption pumping. Now, what is cryosorption pumping? Um, uh, in, in simple terms, it's like using a sponge to soak up um, uh, water. Um, but we're trying to pump a very light gas called helium. So in cryosorption, what we need to do as we can't get cold enough to get the helium atoms to stay on our pumping surface, uh, we have to use the van der Waal forces. Uh, so the van der Waal forces are the forces which um, occur when um, molecules are in close proximity to one another, and the charge which is um, not evenly distributed within the nucleus of the uh, molecule allows a level of attraction between negative and positive um, parts of the, the molecule. So effectively what we need to do is produce a sponge um, which has a lot of surface area because van der Waal forces um, work um, through just on, on close contact um, on a surface. And to do that we um, uh, have found that the best medium is to take uh, coconuts and produce a charcoal from the outer of the coconut. And that charcoal is extremely porous with a one nanometer, with one nanometer um, pores, and it basically acts like a big sponge. So the helium enters into the porous um, structure of the charcoal and finds a big surface. And the Van der Waals forces are enough then to, um, with the cryogenic temperature, in order to give us um, enough force to hold the helium um, on the um, within the charcoal and hence to to pump pump that um, the only problem with um, having uh, charcoal um, is that we then need to raise the temperature to higher temperatures in order to um, release the um, the different gases which get sorbed onto the surface so the configuration of the cryo pumps on ETA is that we have um, six um, pumps around the bottom of ETA which pump the main uh, vacuum chamber. And we have a further two which pump the uh, cryostat. And these sit within what we call the lower port cells of the vessel. Um, each cryo pump is of a bespoke um, design. It has a valve at the front so it can uh, be closed to be uh, regenerated. And uh, the valve is complex because it's one of the largest all metal seal uh, valves with an 800 uh, millimeter diameter. And when pumping, the valve is open. And then within the, um, the main part of the pump, we have our charcoal coated cryo panels. But because they have to operate at low temperature, 4.5K, they then need to be shielded so that there's no radiation coming from warmer parts, which would, uh, which would heat those pumps up. So the six pumps of uh, the main vacuum vessel then act like the engine of fusion. So um, of those six, um, when we're running continuously the fusion reactions, then we have um, four pumping at any one stage, 
and two closed off um, being regenerated, so heated up to 80K to remove the gas and then uh, cooled back down again and then they come back online to pump. Uh, and this is a completely continuous process. Um, it allows us to pump for 3,000 seconds, which is the longest heater pulse we expect, but it could um, go on continuously. Neutral beams um, also use these cryosorption pumps. They're very large pumps. Um, and um, as you saw in the cartoon earlier, um, gas uh, which is injected both for ionization to produce the beam and for neutralizing the beam are pumped by these large 8 metre um, by 2.8 metre panels. Um, and um, these effectively achieve very good vacuum, but they also um, ensure that all gas which is entered in is pumped away apart from the highly energetic uh, beam which heats the plasma. Um, the roughing pump system is within the um, tritium plant and the idea of the roughing pump system is that the main pumps like the uh, torus cryo pumps and the um, neutral beam pumps, um, when they're regenerated they pass their, their gas to the roughing system um, which is in a adjacent uh, building um, and we use three particular cells with what we call a CVC, um, a cryogenic viscous flow compressor, to pump the main um, fueling gases um, from the plasma. The way this works is we have our mixture of helium, deuterium, tritium um, comes into the, um, the pump, which you can see on, on the left at the top, um, and it goes through a baffle which cools it down to 80k. It then enters into um, a heat exchanger with many pipes uh, which have swirl tubes in them. And these swirl tubes, um, as you go down to, towards the bottom, gradually get cooler. So the deuterium, or well, tritium first, then the deuterium, then any um, hydrogen um, get pumped on the walls of this uh, heat exchanger. And the helium goes straight through um, um, and eventually is exhausted. Now, this first stage of cleaning up uh, is very important because our waste product is helium and um, in order to um, in order to yeah, have a clean exhaust we need quite a low temperature to take out the hydrogen isotopes. Um, the helium of course can be used um, for blooms for our children for our next uh, generation and this is the beauty of the cleanness of, of fusion. But to get that really clean um, gas, we have to get very cold at the bottom of this heat exchanger to take out the uh, last bit of those hydrogen uh, isotopes. And to do that, we supercool um, the cryogenic helium. Um, so we have a bath of, of that helium and we use vacuum to supercool it, so we pump on it. And the next demo is just a demo of supercooling, but uh, with water, so not so cold, but how vacuum can be used to um, supercool a, a liquid. Good morning, I'm Silvio from the Vacuum Group and uh, I will show you a very simple experiment about the behavior of liquid water in the vacuum. We start putting uh, a glass of water into a vacuum enclosure. We start at uh, atmospheric pressure and at room temperature and we switch on a vacuum pump. The pressure will go down at constant temperature until it reaches the saturation pressure at room temperature. At this point, the, wa the, the water starts boiling uh, and uh, going on, uh, the temperature will go down because the evaporation removes heat from the water itself. So uh, the system will go down along the saturation curve until the tripod point at which the water will almost instantaneously freeze, at least on the surface. Okay, here we are opening the valve to the vacuum pump and uh, we see that uh, the pressure gauge, the pressure is reducing. Uh, once here we see that uh, the pressure of around 1000 pascal has been reached and the water has started to boil and it's, it has already started to cool down due to the heat removal from evaporation. Uh, the green wire is a thermocouple which measures the temperature. Here we are reaching about 600 Pascal and about 0 degrees C, so very soon we will see the water freezing. In fact, here we start to see a freezing layer on the surface of the water. And 
here is a close up view with the surface of the water frozen. Now we vent the system, we go back to atmospheric pressure, and we show what happened to the glass of water. The surface is frozen, and underneath there is still liquid water. Um, so I'll quickly take you through um, the evolution of the torus cryo pump over over history, and give you just to give you an idea of the complexity of the technology involved. So a brief history of time for a cryo pump. So the first um, cryo pump of um, similar style was uh, put on jet um, in 1989, um, and it was called the lower hybrid cryo pump. And you can see the valve was at the bottom. Um, this made it simpler, but um, and it was a used um, liquid helium as opposed to supercritical helium, which we use on on ETA. This was um, evolved to the first ETA design in, in 1998. Um, there, the valve was placed inside the pump, but unfortunately, uh, when analysed, the valve would cool too much to then seal um, when we got regenerated when we got regenerations and we tried to seal it. Um, the first model size pump, so a half side pump, was made by um, Air Liquide um, over the period 99 to 2005. Um, and this was tested at FZK Karls Karlsruhe um, and eventually dismantled, and a number of um, design issues seen to, to, um, to improve that pump. So we had the first pump um, designed with a design update for ETA by FZK through EFTA. In 2006, then with industrial involvement, a further evolution in 2007, um, then ETA redesigned in 2012 uh, to bring further improvements, to make it more manufacturable, to, to make it um, uh, more robust, and then uh, the first pump was put into manufacturing, um, and still further updates were done um, in order to improve that design. Um, the pump was fully structurally analysed to be uh, good for uh, seismic events and uh, be robust for all situations. Um, this was manufactured. Uh, you see the temperature sensors and the bellows for the shaft. You see the thermal shields being made, um, and you see the charcoal coated panels at the uh, bottom there. Um, the plug, which uh, or the flange, which the pump sits on, being machined there, and its enclosure being trial fitted uh, on the right there. Um, we had issues of trying to get charcoal to actually adhere to the pumps uh, reliably um, and had to develop new methods. Um, eventually all the components were ready for assembly in 2016. Um, thermal shields were assembled, um, the, cry the uh, thermal sensors added, um, and eventually the um, casing of the pump was even welded on um, and very close tolerances, uh, 80 microns, were achieved. Um, final assembly, um, you see the valve there at the front of the pump. Um, the uh, lot of celebration when the first pump passed its um, fat tests and achieved a low leak rate. Um, delivered to the ETA site, uh, more celebration. Um, and now we're in the situation that the production pumps, um, so the eight identical pumps, are under fabrication by our partners, uh, Fusion for Energy, with um, uh, research instruments and Alcium, and they would be delivered to the inter site in, in 2022 and 23. The first pump to be made um, is still being tested at ETA um, to ensure that it, everything can be operated properly, and um, you see it in our test facility at, uh, at ETA there, and we make a new cryogenic test facility uh, ready to test the pumps before they finally go on ETA um, before the first plasma. Now achieving good vacuum on ETA is, um, is not simple because we have so many components which need to be correct. Um, one of the key things is that for vacuum is that we have to consider cleanliness, we have to consider robustness, um, and we have to consider um, the, um, the thorn in the flesh of vacuum, which is the, um, the possibility of a leak. Um, only um, 
a, a leak the size of a human hair can stop the heater from working. So vacuum has to be considered in design, in manufacture, in assembly, in transport, and in operations to make sure that everything is right um, for vacuum. And the key considerations, of course, are the material selection, the cleanliness, the joint structural reliability, the testability, and the leak tightness. And we have to um, consider vacuum at all stages to produce high vacuum. Um, one key thing is testing, and we seismically test many uh, vacuum components. You see the seismic test facility there on the right, and um, you see one of our large metallic seal test rigs there on, on the left. So vacuum leaks um, have caused trouble on many other machines and tokamaks. Um, for example, on CERN, um, 95 internal helium leaks were found um, in the installation at room temperature. And initially, they were able to operate with 21 um, small leaks. So K-Star reported a couple of leaks. Um, the Indian Tokamak SST-1 um, took five years to rebuild after um, the leaks were found. And the um, Stellarator W7X has reported 30 leaks detected and repaired on the vacuum boundary. So, so far at ITA, we're doing well. And we just report one critical leak detected and repaired on a delivered component. Um, so far. Ensuring a successful vacuum and a successful eater um, requires to have uh, a strong uh, team devoted to that and uh, on the left you see uh, the vacuum team and um, very strong clear requirements which are put in the eater vacuum handbook which is available um, on, uh, and published on the eater website. Um, the um, famous um, CERN vacuum uh, leader um, stated in um, one of our workshops back in 2009, leaks have reproducibly uh, been obtained in accelerators by reproducing the same errors over more than 30 years. Will ITER be the first exception? And for co of course, ITER is doing everything it can to ensure it is the first exception. Um, I'd like to acknowledge um, the work of the vacuum team um, at ITER, but also our vacuum teams uh, in the US ITER project office and in the EU F3 um, uh, uh, team as well. Um, they've all put uh, much energy and work into ensuring that ITER has um, a good vacuum. So thank you very much for your attention and I wish you a good day.